This is the recording for lesson 2.15, the genetic basis of evolution. In any given population, the alleles, or as we talked about, their different versions of a gene. For a trait or gene, exist in a ratio to each other. And when we talk about um, a ratio, it's we're going to be talking about how, um, like the proportions of that they exist in. Recall that um, the population of the arc crested fruit doves, so those are the birds with those um, brightly colored feathers that we looked in earlier in this unit. We looked at how natural selection could affect them. Remember how um, some of the birds had green feathers, whereas others had um, purple feathers, and the new predators that came into the environment were more um, likely to see the purple ones, so they were um, hunted a lot more frequently, leading to the rise of the green um, feathered fruit doves. And so we were looking at um, specific traits um, and specific genes, um, specifically the color of their feathers. Again, remember, um, alleles are different versions of one particular gene, um, and each individual carries two alleles for every single trait. Um, and the reason why is because, um, for example, for the feathers, um, let's say that big F was um, purple, Right? and little f was green, each individual would have two um, alleles for that trait. So it could either be two big Fs, one big F, one little f, or two little Fs. And the reason why they have two is because they get one from their mom and one copy from their dad. Okay, so for every single trait, you have two alleles. It could be the same or it can be different, but you get one from your mom and one from your dad. And so today what we're going to be learning about is this um, equation called the Hardy-Weinberg equation. And the Hardy-Weinberg equation will help us figure out allele frequencies in a population. And so first, you need to know how do you exactly do you calculate the frequency of alleles. And so um, we can look at these questions right here. So if there are 20 birds in population A, um, how many alleles are present for the feather color trait? So remember, for each bird, they have two letters or two alleles. For example, this one is little f, little f, right? Um, so if we have 20 birds, right, and each of them have two alleles, then that means that the total number of alleles in this population for the fe feather color trait would be 40, which is right here. And then the next question we would need to know in order to figure out the frequency of each allele is how many of the little f's do we see? And so if you count each of the little f's, so if it's little f, little f, that'd be two. Um, if it's big f, little f, right here, that would be one for this bird. If we total all of them up here, you would see that there would be 17 little f's in this population. And to figure out the um, number of big f's in the population, you can either count it up in the same way or you can use um, this equation where you take the total number of alleles subtracted by the amount of little f's, um, so that would be 40 minus 17, and that would give you 23 um, big f's in this population. Okay, if we look at this slide, Um, we can look at the different allele um, frequencies in another population, population B. So if population B has 20 birds, right, how many big F and little f alleles are present in the population? And let's say that 
Um, if we were to count all of them up, we would find that little f's, there are 23, and big f's, there are 17. Okay, the next thing you would need to figure out is how many of them are homozygous recessive. Remember, homozygous is the word that we use for same, right? And the recessive is going to be um, the lowercase allele, the one that is not dominant, okay? So if they are the same and they are the lowercase allele, then that means that it would, when we talk about re homozygous recessive, we're talking about little f, little f. So you would want to count up how many birds are homozygous recessive and then how many alleles would this represent. So if we counted up all of the ones that were little f, little f, I'll go ahead and circle them. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. Okay, so we have eight birds with little f, right? We see right here. And that means that if we multiply it by two, right, we can figure out how many little f's are in these birds, and that would be 16 alleles for the little f. Okay, so we counted in the beginning that there were 23 little f's, right? Out of the 23, 16 of them are from homozygous recessive birds. So where does the other seven alleles come from? Why is it that we only have 16 when we count the little f, little f, whereas if we count all of them in the population, we see 23? And the reason why is because, remember, we have the heterozygous. And remember, heterozygous means different, right? Hetero means different. And so that means we're talking about alleles that are big F and little f. So that would be the genotype that carries that little f allele, right, but does not show that green feather trait. Okay, now we can look at population C. And population C also has 20 birds, right? Which means times two, they have 40 alleles total, right? And if we were to count the amount that had green feathers, we would see one, two, three, four, and five, right? And if we counted the amount with purple feathers, it would be all the other birds meaning it would be 20 minus 5, which would equal 15 with purple feathers. And then we can figure out how many little f alleles are in population C. So how would we figure that out? Okay, so um, that means we would look at all of the green birds, right? We see five green birds, right? So if we have little f, little f, we have five of them. So we could do 5 times 2, which is equal to 10 little f's, right? But remember, we also have to consider the big F, little f, because they also have the little f, right? So we have to consider how many heterozygous do we have. So we can look at them. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, and 11, okay? So we have 11 of the big F, little f's. And to figure out how many little f's are in these heterozygous, we have to look at how many are in each um, genotype. And we see that there are one, right? One for each of um, the genotypes. So if we have 11 and each of them have one, we do one times 11, which would equal 11 little f's. So then we total up these two. We have 10 little f's from the green birds and 11 little f's from the purple birds. So 10 plus 11 would equal 21, which we get right here. Okay. So to calculate the frequency or um, how common something is or the percentage of it, what we would do is we would divide um, each allele, how many alleles there are, by the total. Okay. So the frequency of little f, how we would calculate it would be we have 
21 little f's, right? And the total amount that we have, remember we said that the total amount was 40, because there are 20 births, 20 times 2 is 40. So little f would be 21 over 40, which would be around 52.5%. So that's how, um, that's allele frequency for little f. If we were to look at the frequency for big F, right, what we would do is we would take, we know that there's 21 of the little Fs, so that means that there must be 19 of the big Fs, right? Because we could do, I'll do it right here, um, 40 minus 21 is equal to 19 big Fs. And we would take that 19 number and put it all over the total number of alleles, which is 40, and that would give us 47.5%. So this would be the allele frequency for big F, and this would be the allele frequency for little f. Okay, and there are just a couple more things that we have to go over for this equation. You know that little f is recessive, right, which means that um, it can be masked if it's coupled with a dominant allele. So if we have little f, little f, that's going to code for the green feathers. In population C, there are only 5 birds out of 20 with green feathers. So 5 out of 20 equals to 1 out of 4, which is equal to 25%. So 25% have green feathers. Earlier we found out that the frequency of little f though is 52.5%. Okay, so even though we only see 25% of the birds with green feathers, the green allele is actually much more um, freak, is much more common than um, that number suggests. And the reason why it's so high, um, the reason why it's 52.5% is because this number here doesn't account for the heterozygous birds, the ones that have the dominant and the recessive gene. If the birds in population C did not have their genotype showing, would you be able to immediately tell which birds are heterozygous? So what this question is asking is if you were to look at this bird right here, that's big F, little f, heterozygous, or this bird here, that's um, homozygous dominant, would you be able to tell which one also had the green allele gene? No, you wouldn't be able to tell, right? Because um, they both have the same phenotype the physical appearance even though their genotypes are different. Okay, but what we're going to do is we're going to learn about the Hardy-Weinberg equation and that equation um, is kind of a mathematical way that we can figure out um, not just the phenotypic frequencies but also the genotypic frequencies in a population. Okay, so um, this is review from Biology A where we know that um, every single gene right, or every single version of a gene or allele has a different frequency, okay? So we have an allele frequency for each allele. In the doves and li lizards, the traits you studied started with a one-to-one -one frequency, which means they were equally um, frequent or common. But really, any frequency can exist. So, for example, um, if we were to look at this butterfly right here, this Miami blue butterfly, um, we can have two different alleles, right? So it could be dull wings or it could be vibrant wings. And the ratio could be something like 6 to 1, right, where we have six vibrant butterflies to every one dull butterfly, or you could even have alleles that have ratios that are 10 to 1, 50, or 50 to 1, or 1,000 to 1, okay? And a common question that always comes up is, why doesn't the dominant allele just take over? Because remember, if we have um, something like big B, little b, this big B would actually um, show or be expressed, right? And then this one would just be, um, would be hidden. So a lot of people think, well, why doesn't the dominant ones just take over and then these eventually become extinct? The answer is both.
um, in evolution and in genetics, and we'll be taking a look at that. Okay, so um, for example, um, I don't know if any of you guys have met someone with six fingers, um, but there it is a dominant trait to have six fingers. Um, however, we know that it isn't the most common thing. Most babies are not born with six fingers, um, but it is dominant. Okay, so the reason why um, this dominant trait isn't becoming more and more popular, or uh, maybe common is a better word, is because it doesn't really have any usefulness. Okay, so um, because there's no advantage that exists for this allele for extra fingers and toes, its frequency isn't going to change. Remember, if we have a gene or a trait um, or an allele for a gene or trait that um, is useful, makes a organism more fit, more likely to survive and reproduce, then those um, alleles will change over time and will become more and more common. However, because this um, trait is pretty neutral, it doesn't serve any advantage for the um, individual the frequency of this gene actually stays the same over time. Okay, so we talked a little bit about Hardy-Weinberg and all of the ways that it can help us figure out allele frequencies. Um, so the key though is that the Hardy-Weinberg equation can only be used in an unchanging population and we'll go over what those requirements are for a population to be considered unchanging. But basically um, one of the equations um, that you can use is P plus Q equals 1 and what that means is that we'll take P and Q, P will be for the dominant and then Q would be for the recessive. Um, it'll be the recessive frequency in a decimal and the dominant frequency in a decimal and they have to both add up to one. And that makes sense because if these two are in a decimal they're like percentages and they have to equal to a hundred percent. Okay, so in a Hardy-Weinberg um, situation or population, um, the ac actual numbers of P and Q um, will never change if the five conditions that we'll talk about are met, which means that the population is not changing. So if the population isn't changing and the allele frequencies aren't changing, evolution is at a standstill. We don't have a, a change over time in allele frequencies. So although populations can and actually do meet these conditions for maybe a little bit, um, in general it's pretty rare to see it happening for an extended period of time. But when it does, um, we call it the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium where we have a balance that exists in the allele frequencies, meaning that there isn't any change. So we're going to go ahead and go over the five conditions that must be met in order for the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium um, to be achieved. Okay, so here are the five requirements. Okay, so here we have wildebeest and um, in this population the five um, requirements are actually met. So it has to be a large population size, so it can't just be like five fish. There has to be random mating, which means certain um, individuals aren't favored over others. Um, it would have to be no natural selection, so all the traits and alleles um, give equal chances of survival and reproduction. There can't be any migration, meaning no one can come in to the population. And there can't be any mutation, which are changes to the DNA that can cause for new traits. Um, the Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium states that as soon as any of these five conditions are disrupted, then evolution will be occurring in the population. So that way we can define evolution as the change in allele frequencies. If we have all of these five met, allele frequencies will stay the same and Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium will be achieved. Okay, so another condition that can potentially affect allele frequencies are lethal genes and lethal means deadly 
Okay, so some alleles of genes are actually lethal to an organism. That is, if inherited, the organism will not survive. Um, lethal genes can either be dominant or recessive. If it's dominant, right, that means either big F, big F, or big F, little f will um, lead to death. Right? But if it's recessive, then that means that only little f, little f will lead to death. Okay, so depending on the lethal gene, some are carried in the dominant allele, others are carried in the recessive allele. But what's important is to think about when a lethal gene is expressed. Because you might think, if a gene is truly lethal, um, wouldn't it just disappear from a population? And you know, in fact, a lot of them are. Um, some lethal genes will not allow for a woman to um, carry out a pregnancy because the gene in the child does not allow for development, right? But in a lot of cases, some adults may have lethal genes, causing them to sometimes pass it on to their children. So this man here is carrying a lethal dominant gene, but why is he still alive? So something important to know is that some lethal genes are not turned on until later in life. So he could have this lethal um, dominant gene that's not expressed, but when he reaches 40 or some, or at some certain age, it's suddenly turned on and then causes him to die. But by that time, when he finds out that he has it, it may have already been passed on um, to his children. Um, another situation is if you have a recessive form of the gene, and if you have a recessive form of the gene, then that means someone who is homozygous recessive, or like for example, little r, little r, will have the trait. But if it's turned on later in life, again, the individual could pass it on um, to his children. But remember, if you have a little r, little r, right, and it's a recessive, then um, if the child got it, let's say, if the child got a little r, little r, then that means he got the little, the lethal gene from mom and the lethal gene from dad. So um, the lethal gene, when it's carried on the recessive allele, is actually much more rare just because it's much more difficult to pass on to the next um, child. Okay, so if it's recessive, then that means sometimes you can have someone like this guy who has big R, little r, right? He's heterozygous, and this is right here the lethal gene, but it is not expressed. Why? Because if he has the healthy dominant gene. So he will never have the trait full on, but there is a 50% chance that he will pass it on to the lethal, the lethal allele to his children. So although he doesn't show any signs of it, he can pass this one on to his children, right? And they could also be a carrier of this gene. Okay, so an example of a lethal gene that you might have heard of is called sickle cell disease. Um, and basically what happens is that um, because of the shape of the human red blood cells, um, it's unable to pick up oxygen effectively. Okay, so this is what um, your red blood cell typically looks like. Inside of the red blood cell, it's going to have um, hemoglobin, which again carries that oxygen. Okay, so if you have sickle cell disease, you now um, have blood cells that look something like this one on the left. And so again, you cannot carry um, oxygen effectively, uh, meaning that um, it's just hard for your um, muscles, your organs, um, your whole entire body to receive the amount of oxygen that is necessary. So most people with a double recessive condition, so meaning that they have um, both of the they have um, two alleles for this gene are at risk for early death. So sickle cell disease is considered a lethal gene. Um, however, because sickle cell allele is recessive, remember a heterozygous person or one with different alleles, so it could be like big R, little r, can be a carrier of this disease. So it has one of the sickle cell disease, right, and then one healthy. Okay, and what's really um, 
what's really interesting about this is that if you have, um, if you are heterozygous for the sickle cell disease, they are actually resistant to malaria, a common and often deadly parasite that has ravaged humans for hundreds of generations. So even though you would think it would be better um, to be homozygous dominant for this gene rather than heterozygous, it actually proves to be um, in advance. Uh, it proves that being heterozygous for this trait can be advantageous to those that are exposed to malaria. Um, natural selection may be choosing the heterozygous carriers for the disease in some situations because um, if you live in an environment that um, actually has malaria um, present. Okay, so here's a summary of what we went over today. Um, remember, allele frequencies. Um, they are constant, right? And constant meaning not changing in a population under certain conditions. And those certain conditions, remember, we call them the Hardy-Weinberg um, equilibrium conditions. Okay, so we have no migration, no one coming in and out, no mutations in the DNA, no natural selection, which means um, all traits um, equal a result in equal survival. Um, we have random mating, so no one favored over another, and it has to be a large enough population um, because remember, any little change in a small population would then cause evolution. Okay, so remember, if these conditions are not met, then we know that the allele frequencies are changing over time, which means the result would be evolution. So some important vocabulary we went over today is the Hardy-Weinberg principle, a mathematical model that can be used to predict allele frequencies and phenotypes in a population that is not changing. And then we also have lethal gene. Remember, a gene that when expressed can lead to death. So this can be um, early or, oops, early or later in life. Lethal gene does not mean that you um, die right away, but it can happen later on in life, which is how um, this gene gets passed on in the population.